we're in a box now with the next gen car. Obviously, everybody's got the same parts and pieces, and there's only so many, you know, combinations we can get with that. And and it's getting it's getting more and more optimized. They can do that without a lot of ado. It's it's not it's not like okay, they got to build all new engines or anything like that. That's a lot of laps on tires that it drivers is. should not be, be able is. to go that far. No. You know, you never know when you're just going to have an off weekend. I've kind of gotten the ability to have the platform that uh, I want, and, and it is my platform, and I can speak to whatever I feel like talking about. We were in the mix, and it makes it a lot more fun when you're in the mix than you are just, you know, struggling and, and trying to figure out what direction it goes. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, and sorry for it being bouncy the roads here. It's, not, it's like if you have, you know, the all-you-can-eat buffet every single day of the week, people are going to get tired of it, right? So if it's a special thing, I think people get more excited for it. Bye, Bo. Raise your hand up so she can see it. There you go. Interestingly, even as a company, I think it was, you know, very head-scratching why at the beginning we, all four of us, just went instantly straight to the back. We just really struggled. Welcome to the Backstretch. I am News 5's Heather Williams and William Byron. He is on quite a roll this season. He has won three races this year, um, two of which I've been at, by the way. Uh, Christopher Bell, my little, I want to watch out. He and I had a long-standing joke that I was like his good luck charm, but apparently this season I am William Byron's good luck charm. Of course, really what that means is that uh, – Bell back a couple years ago when I won when he won when I was there a lot. William Byron this year it means that they're just running really well. I mean the 24 car and William Byron over the last season now and a third, easily the most dominant team in the garage area, running better than Kyle Larson, running better than any of his other Hendrick teammates, running better than anyone at Joe Gibbs Racing been impressive it's really been impressive to see the mojo that they've got going on Rudy Fugel has turned out to be quite the cup series crew chief I think the chemistry that they have is impeccable and if you've listened to me to, or followed me for any amount of time I have long believed that that is that is the secret sauce to really having a good team you have to have a good driver and a good crew, crew, crew chief and they have to gel you don't have those three ingredients it's just not going to work out and it is certainly working for William Byron a win at Martinsville as I mentioned his third on the year he's gonna be tough to beat this year he looked like he was pretty tough to beat last year and he almost won the championship made it to the championship four so we'll see what Willie B has in store for the rest of the season coming up this week on the backstretch we are going to talk about Martinsville with our crew chief Chris Carey as well as the other headlines of the day and our guest this week for the second time this year will be Eric Jones driving the number 43 for Petty I'm sorry the name of that team has changed it is Legacy Motor Club Woo! got caught a couple years ago it happens from time to time when you get my age you, you mess that up a little bit but I talked with Eric about his season so far, their transformation in Toyota, being a Toyota team, how that's helped them. Um, really, they're a team that's run pretty well this year, just pretty, maybe hasn't got the finishes they feel like they deserve. So Eric and I will chat about all of those things. So let's get this week's podcast rolling. Joining us now is our crew chief, Chris Carrier, who's also the crew chief of the number 75 food country truck in the Crash Mid Truck Series. Hendrick Motorsports gets a historic win at Martinsville. On the weekend, they celebrated 40 years in the sport, and the HMS cars finished 1, 2, 3 this weekend. William Byron has his third win of the year. How dominant is Hendrick right now, more specifically, the 24 team? Wow, Heather, for all that to be going on and, you know, the memories that they have at Martinsville, their first win came at Martinsville, and then they had a very tragic day at Martinsville not too awful long ago when the day that they lost several several people, including Ricky Hendrick. But, um, you know, the 24 team is just, man, they just got all their carrots in one bowl here. They, they are clicking on all cylinders. They're doing doing everything right. You were talking like even, you know, Rudy said the, the best pit decision, the winning strategy, so it was actually a, a miscue on his part, whether, you know, whatever, but uh, 
you know, they've, they've just, the, the confidence is there. They've got faith in one another. The equipment is there, obviously, and the teamwork is there. They've got everything going in their direction. So, uh, you know, they've won three races already this year. Um, man, it's, it's, I'd say the sky's the limit for this crew. And, you know, congratulations to Hendrick Motorsport. 40 years they've been in this stuff. And to get that historic win at Martinsville, they had, what, something like 1,800 employees in the stands yes. or something like that, uh, and families too. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it, was, it was good to see that uh, for that entire organization and Rick Hendrick and the people like Jeff Gordon and Chad Knauss who are now uh, management, you know, and, and helping control all this. So uh, it's, it's probably gonna be a good rest of the year for that team. And, and of course, William Byron will be the one, one of the ones we'll see going for the playoffs later in the year. He'll have a spot and uh, man, uh, right now it's like, man, I'd hate to play him. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's like that team that gets red hot in the season yeah. nobody wants to face. Yeah. Usually that's my Chiefs, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> had to throw that there. Yeah. Uh, there are still some grumblings, though, about the short track package. NASCAR says it is working on a fix. If you were in NASCAR, how would you fix it? Well, the, it seems to me like there's a lot of chatter from the drivers and other people that maybe you give, you know, put more horsepower in these things, which they can do that without a lot of ado. It's, it's, not, it's not like, okay, they gotta build all new engines or anything like that. They can make some adjustments with the, the tools that they have in their hand to, to tune these motors and, and make it to where they can make more horsepower or limit the horsepower. So it's in their hands. It's a question of like, okay, what's the cost gonna be for the teams and the engine builders, so on and so forth, that if we do this, what's gonna be the actual cost? And we wanna keep that under control. Um, Denny Hamlin's podcast, I think, I, I, I listened to about 45 seconds of it this week, but it was good stuff. He said, you know, he explained about at the end of the race, he had new tires, he was back in the pack, he was trying to pass cars. He, Austin Dillon, or Austin Sendrick, I believe, was the one that was kind of up there in front of him, and he said, I was way better than him, and I planned on trying to move him to where I could get up to some people to pass and, and get positions. He said, but I just couldn't get there. He said, I could not get to his bumper because my, the, the, the package, the now what they've got now, it wouldn't allow him to get there. And he was pretty, pretty vocal about like, we need to fix this. And if we don't fix it, it's our fault. I thought that was good stuff. Now, if I agree 100% or not with what he's saying, if he's 100% correct, I'm not saying that, but it was good, it was good food for thought. And yes, I do think they need to do something. If I could wave a magic wand, I'd say, let's put, let's put another 150 horsepower to these things. Let's give them some tires that will wear out, not, not in five laps or 10 laps, but maybe at Martinsville, 60, 70 laps into a run, they're like, man, I need tires. I can't go anywhere. I'm gonna have to come pit. I'm running so slow. And I think all that right there would, would, would produce maybe some more passing. It would be like a watered down version of what we had at Bristol. Right. And what we had at Bristol was one thing about it was there was a lot of passing. Well, you know, in Martinsville, Joey Logano didn't change left side tires for um, for the first two stages. He only mm -hmm. put on right, right and almost made it two full stages. And I think with about 15 laps to go in the final stage, he started losing those tires and fell through the field. But that's a lot of laps on tires that it drivers is. should not be, it, be it able is. to go that far. No, I, I think that, you know, the, the, uh, what, what a lot of people like Denny Hamlin are thinking right now, that, it, that the, the art of being able to take care of your tires and still race hard and still get to the front and stay in the front, but do it for a, a longer time and then say, okay, I gotta come get tires and go. That, that art of being able to baby them a little bit is kind of gone. And he made a good point. He said, you know, now the cars are all the same. We're all doing the same things. And he said, the drivers, there's so much, you know, there's simulation and so much data available. He said, we all drive the same. So he said, you know, if, if the cars stay the same speed, how are we ever gonna have passing in real racing? To be fair on Denny Hamlin liking the tire management, of course he did, as he reminded sure. me in victory lane at Bristol. I won doing this, so of course he's gonna like that well, solution. But it is a good point. I mean, something has point. to be done for sure. Yes. Uh, we mentioned Joey Logano. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact the Fords 
continued to struggle. Ryan Blaney got a top five, but you didn't really see Joey Logano led all those laps no. by not taking tires. Other than Blaney, though, you really didn't see Forge running that well. Todd Gilliland no. ran pretty good, especially for him. But as a group, they still seem to be struggling. They, I feel like, Heather, I, I'm not really sure what's going on. I've talked to a couple people or, that I know that's within those camps, and they're, they're, they seem to be a little bit confused at this point. And I, I think that, you know, you don't see any races. There's no races we've seen, I think, that, that any of the Ford group has, has gone out and throughout the race, throughout the weekend, you say, oh, gosh, that car or those two cars or this team is the team to beat. They're a real threat to win this race no matter what. It, it just hasn't been there. They've had some good qualifying efforts and they've had a good, you know, led some laps here and this, that, and other, but they just haven't been strong. And, and it's all, like you said, it's all across the board. It's not just Penske Racing. It's not just Haas. It's not Brad Keselowski's team. It's, it's really all of them. And I don't really know what the answer is. Uh, you know, NASCAR always wants to have parity, especially among the car makes. Well, let's face it, that what's, that's what keeps still a good percentage of our fans coming. They want to see a Ford. They want to see a Chevrolet or a Toyota or whoever to, you know, to, to be competitive. And if, they're, if they feel like they're just not well, they're not going to win, they're just not any good this year, they may start coming, they may start stop, they may stop coming or stop watching. And yeah, we don't want that. For sure. No. So this week, if you're watching, NASCAR is in Texas. I know you guys are running the truck race yes, there this night. weekend. How do you attract attack the big tra track well, in Fort Worth? This is a this is a mile and a half track, but it's not your your basic uh, granddad's cookie cutter mile and a half track. It's it. Uh, I guess maybe two thirds of it is or so. The 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 third and fourth turn is is pretty much wide open, like for trucks anyway. Uh, pretty much wide open. It's got some banking. It's the uh, uh, normal configuration. Uh, it's pretty fast, and, but then you get down at the end of the front straightaway, the dog leg, the front straightaway, and go in turn one and two. It's it's very flat. It's it's not. Um, like nice and round it, it, it is not symmetrical so you go in there and, and it's uh you know it's a little bit hard to turn and you get to a point now you got to turn more and it's right at a time when you're trying to throttle up and go down that back stretch, get some speed down the back stretch and, and get your lap time and you know the wall comes up pretty quickly uh, I understand this week, too, they are not going to use any track treatment. So that's a little different. We'll see how that plays out and also plays out with the tire wear also, you know, with this race. So there's a few uh, tricks and turns to this, little quirks. And I think the weather's going to be good for most of the entire weekend. And we'll, we'll see. There should be some good racing. And there's some teams that, that need to make headway this week. We talked about the Fords. You know, they, they need to start making headway. And some of these racetracks somewhere, like Texas, could be a place where they hit the setup and could be the teams to beat. So we'll see. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Eric. Um, so we've come off a string here of, what, two of the last three races have been on the short tracks. A lot has been made about the short track package from a casual perspective, I saw some good and some bad. From inside the race car, what have you seen from this run of, of short tracks? I would, you know, similar. <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, we, we've had, you know, Richmond wasn't a bad race, I didn't think. Um, Brazil was definitely a more challenging race, I think, as a viewer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we obviously switched up the short track package this year with the diffuser and tried something different there. And you know, I think it's helped a hair. Um, I don't, I think it helped at Richmond. I don't know if it really helped at Martinsville. Um, you know, I, I think Martinsville is more challenging in some ways that the arrow isn't probably as effective. It's more of a, a tire and a power combination and, you know, the shifting and the braking there. So there's a lot of different things, you know, I think we've kind of got to the point now with the arrow changes that there's probably not a, um, fix all in that world i think it's going to probably come down to some different different options you know we saw at bristol obviously a pretty unique tire and race from that tire so i think there's some options there going forward we could take to some more tracks so you know we'll see uh obviously though there's there's definitely i think some room we we can improve and, and get this short track racing better 
has, has it become too much parody in, in the sport? I mean, which sounds crazy to say, but I look at the drivers and I see 25 drivers that are all very talented, capable of winning easily, maybe more than that each week. All the cars are, are so similar now. All the teams have really stepped up their game. Should NASCAR maybe let people go back to adjusting on their cars? To, is it, would that be a fix? I mean, I look at you guys as a perfect example because, I mean, your team is just as capable as anyone, but it seems frustrating because you can't pass or get around people to show it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that's definitely a, an argument to be had. Um, you know, we're, we're in a box now with the next-gen car. Obviously, everybody's got the same parts and pieces, and there's only so many you know combinations we can get with that and and it's getting it's getting more and more optimized right everybody is getting probably closer and closer into the same exact box um you know everybody's starting to figure out what the car likes and what it wants and you know driver preferences are starting to figure out kind of what we want from the car so you know it's definitely reduced um that option um i don't know that we can really change that with the next gen car now you know we've kind of went down this path of everybody having the same thing so you know it's tough you go to a place like martinsville and you know we were all running you know, almost the same speed uh through the front 20 cars um so it's challenging for sure i think the parity is is definitely there and, and higher than it's ever, ever been but it's made the racing challenging for sure so this sounds weird given where we were three or four years ago, but are you excited to go to Texas? Because this car seems to put on much better racing at tracks like Texas. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, you know, multiple reasons. One, you just mentioned this car is just better on these mile and a half tracks and, you know, puts on better racing. Um, Texas has been good to us. We ran really well there in the fall race. We didn't get to finish, but we were, you know, a top two car all day on speed. So, um, that's exciting going back, you know, when you're going back to a place that you've ran well in the past and had speed, you, you look forward to that and hopefully carrying that on. But, you know, I think it's going to be good. Actually, Texas has put on some good races with this car in the, uh, in the last couple of years compared to what, what we had with the old car, I, I think. So, um, I'm looking forward to that and, and hopefully we have the same kind of speed we did again. And, um, you know, we've only had really the one mile and a half this year in, in Vegas. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward to just getting back on another one. How's the transition to Toyota been for you guys? I look at you and John Hunter and I see speed. I see you guys are, are having good runs. Kind of you in 2311, I see kind of the same thing. Just not the finishes you probably have deserved this year. Do you feel like you're, you're maybe this close to getting to where you want to be? Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're getting there. We, um, the 43 team, we, we definitely didn't get some finishes. We, um, where we ran uh, early in the season. And, and now these last couple of weeks, we've put together two two good races, two races where we, we ran where we were capable of. Um, you know, we ended up 14th, 13th, 14th at, uh, at Richmond and, and then 12th at Martinsville, which is, which is where we were on speed. And so um, just put together smooth days. And those two tracks were probably pretty high on our list of struggles last year. I think that was probably two of the worst. <laughs> worst races we had so it was nice to have uh improvement from that um so yeah hoping to just put together an another good day at texas you know we've we've just had a lot of changes obviously moving to toyota we brought our pit crew in house so getting those guys you know up to speed and comfortable and and pitting well consistently you know getting everybody um rolling on on, on all these different fronts takes time and we're you know i think we're getting there now there's still some things we've got to sort out and, and get better um, and, and some of it's just not going to be better till the second half of the year. But, you know, I think this, this stretch coming up attracts, um, will be pretty good for us. When you're making the transition, cause somebody else that I, uh, interviewed lately said this, when you're making the transition with so little practice, do you spend some of these races maybe where it's not a great day testing, trying things, um, trying to figure it out, be, it may, almost yeah. like a practice. Yeah, you know, somewhat. Um, obviously, we're trying to make a good, educated guess on what's going to be um, good and, and drive good and be fast. But, you know, the places we've had um, practice, we've, we've, we've ran better. You know, Phoenix, we had a really good car and, and we were probably going to run top 10 till the end. And, you know, that was the place we went and tested in the off season. We had a full 50 minute practice session that weekend. 
so if you can give us an opportunity to get our stuff better, I, I think, you know, we can do it. Um, but we have to make good guesses and on our sim and, and going into the weekend. And that's not, you know, always easy, uh, especially transition manufacturers and not having, you know, the data to look back on from years past, we've kind of had to come up with our own and our own offsets to make it work. So, you know, so that kind of goes back to what, you know, some of the stuff isn't going to get better till the second half of the season and, and having some, you know, data and resources to look back on. But, you know, I think there's, there's places for sure we can, we can make good educated guesses going in. For my final thought today, I want to talk about the short track package. I was in Martinsville. I think I mentioned that um, at the first part of the podcast and I'll be honest with you, it was not as bad to me as Martinsville has been under the next gen car um there were some strategies some things going a little uh cat and mouse that made it at least a little bit interesting um throughout the course of the race but short track program has got problems we can't just be making when we're from here to here <laughs> on where we need to be we can't just be inching you know this much every time we go to a track and expect to have real improvement. You heard Chris talk about it. I'm kind of in the same agreement. I don't necessarily agree with him on the on the point that we should be fixing horsepower, but I do think there should be something with the tires, a little more tire fall off. I get it. Goodyear does not want the tires to disintegrate. Bristol, they don't want that again. It made for interesting, exciting racing, but they're trying to sell tires. And when tires don't hold up, they don't want that. But I think there can be a happy median. I mean, none of us expect our tires to last forever. And so why would we expect that in a race? I think we can have fall off and the difference between brand new tires and, you know, 200 lap tires and still, you know, give Goodyear what they want as well. So that's kind of the solution I see. I don't know, you know, Eric talked about it a little bit in his interview. You were kind of boxed in on what we can do with the next gen car. So these are the solutions that are out there. Something obviously has to be done. I love that we're going to Texas this week, which I never thought that I would say just because the intermediate tracks have been so great in this car, but I want to see all the tracks be great. I live three miles from a short track. I want the short track racing to be good. Of the tracks that I get to, most of them are short tracks because you have Bristol, you have Martinsville, you have North Wilkesboro. You know, I'm going to North Wilkesboro here in a few weeks, and I'm not that excited about it because I ex actually expect it to maybe be worse than Martinsville. It certainly was last year. Kyle Larson got out front, and nobody could get past him. So we'll see. Hopefully NASCAR will have something up their sleeves. You know, for the most part, uh, they've made some pretty good decisions under the current regime. It's mostly forward-thinking and forward-moving, so hopefully they will find a solution for this as well, sooner rather than later, because I think the biggest thing is that these people are just losing their patience. Like they want, they want a solution sooner. Thanks for joining us in the backstretch. We'll see you next week.